Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies, on this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Risa Gru. She's a functional nutritionist and a certified autoimmune coach. And she's the author of the book, Food Frame. Diet is a four letter word. It's a fun title. Now, Food Frame is cool because Risa's looking at things in terms of how diets can really mess us up if we do the wrong one. And really, here's the thing, getting rid of this concept of diet, it's more the concept of, doc, what should I be eating? And Risa really breaks it down in terms of what's best for folks and how to use this framework to determine what particular food should you be eating at any particular season of your life based on what you're going through. So i am really enjoyed my podcast interview with Arisa, and I hope you guys will too. We talk a lot about food. We talk a lot about how helpful it can be based on certain conditions and what you can do, but also how to get your kids involved. So let's jump into the podcast. Hey, Health Junkies, I have Risa Gru on, and boy, we are going to be talking about something that's probably the most common question that I get asked hands down and probably have been asked hands down in the last 15 years of being in practice. Doc, what do I eat? So Risa, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So you have a story that is probably not unlike a lot of folks that come into my office. They know something's off. They're not really sure what it is. And they're going, could it maybe possibly be my food? But I hope it's not. Please tell me it's not my food. So (laughs) I think it's from me. Right, right. Like, no. So tell us, give us a little background on you in terms of your story here and how it brought you to creating such a huge, like I'm looking at your programs online. Folks are going to be blown away. So, so give us the background. How did you discover? Yeah. So, you know, the problem. Well, we kind of all have a little shtick with food, right? Mm -hmm. We're punished with it. We're rewarded with it. We're celebrated with it. I mean, as we grow up, we have this really kind of strange relationship about food, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just what we eat for fuel, right? Not like brushing our teeth. We're just, we have a lot of more attachment to it. And so I grew up my, in my home, my mom was, I felt like she was always on this diet. You know, she was trying to lose the same five to 10 pounds her whole entire, my entire childhood. And it was, you know, foods were fattening or they were bad or they were good. Or, and I thought, what, why is, why, what's, what's this relationship with food? It's food, right? We should be eating it. Why is some bad? And so, so I got this really bad relationship with food and then, you know, it, it caused me to be a chronically on this diet, you know, in high school, which I, I probably had to lose about three pounds. And so it was just always this deprivation and starvation. And, and so as I grew older, you know, it never really got better as I think as women, we really suffer with our relationship with food. Right. And so, um, and so it didn't really help me. And then, um, and, and I was always interested in, in, in nutrition. I just was fascinated by it my whole life. And, Uh, then I got married and I, uh, conceived my first child with no problem. And then, um, I could not conceive my second child. I couldn't hold the baby. I couldn't, um, get pregnant. And I started to take a deep dive. And through that process, I found out that I had this underachieving thyroid, right? I was diagnosed with hypothyroid and I thought, why is my thyroid an underachiever? So I started deep, deep diving into this. And um, anyway, I came, I finally did get pregnant. I did um, some uh, acupuncture and then I realized I had this gene mutation, which is very, very common called MTHFR that can cause infertility and miscarriages. And so I started taking methylated B vitamin. And next thing you know, I got pregnant, had a very healthy pregnancy and I have two fabulous kids. But shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's where you're, it's an autoimmune disease attacking your thyroid gland. And I thought, wow, what is going on in my body? Why am I in the state of attack? And so I was already at that point through my process in nutrition, in my education program. And then I uh, realized that um, everybody almost has Hashimoto's, right? It's everywhere. And everybody, it feels like has uh, autoimmune disease. And we're rapidly increasing our numbers of autoimmunity and um, I just did a major deep dive. And, and so it, I was already en route to becoming a nutritionist. I left my corporate uh, sports marketing uh, jobs 
in the past and I uh, followed my passions and became a nutritionist and people started walking in my door and I would give them the exact same eating program. And I would say, this is great. And then some people would walk in and say, this is amazing. And some people would say, I don't feel well, this doesn't, it's not working for me. Mm -hmm. And I really tried to figure out why is it that some people can eat a certain way, but others can't. We all know that story where that new, um, diet type book comes out, right? right? We all say, oh my God, I, you know, I've lost 42 pounds and, you know, and, but and my neighbor lost nothing, right? right? Or conversely, you know, you know, my neighbor lost 42 pounds and I went on keto and I went on keto and I, I didn't think I lost a pound, right? So I realized that not every eating lifestyle is for every single person. Absolutely. And that we really like, we're in this day and age now, we're in the 2022 that we should be, um, you know, people know Netflix knows what we like to watch on TV. Spotify knows what we like to listen to. We should be customizing our food to exactly what we are meant to eat. And so I figured out, I created my food frame method mm -hmm. and I realized that we should be all eating according to our current health status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like, like to, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I kind of interrupted you. Yeah, no, 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 no. I was just saying, so if you have blood sugar dysregulation, there are certain different eating lifestyles that you would be best to follow. So when I wrote my book, Food Frame, I really took the six major diet types or eating lifestyles that are best suited for pretty much everybody I work with. Occasionally, I have to go out of the box for a specialty, but for the most part, it is these six different diet types. And, um, and it works. It really is amazing. When you eat according to what your health status is, you start to thrive, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a fire in the basement. There's no way we're going to be giving out our resources, right? For those people who have, uh, you know, I get them in my office occasionally, they've done everything that they possibly can, and they still can't lose weight. They eat well, and they, the thyroid's good. All these things are good. But what about their inflammation numbers? Because, you know, as I said, there's a fire in the basement, our allopathic conventional medicine uh, physicians will give them a little squirt gun, right? Maybe mm -hmm. here, try and put the fire out with this. So you need a fire hose, right? And then once the body's out of the state of, of urgency, then the body can start giving out resources. But right at, at the time of inflammation and, and um, urgency, they hold on to every single resource that it has. So it, it just doesn't, doesn't want to give up weight. Yeah. You know, that's such a common thing. And especially as we head into perimenopause and beyond, it seems like there's just with that inflammation factor, there's just the switch that just goes. And a lot of women I will hear over and over again, doc, I've tried every diet. I'm done. I don't care anymore. And, you know, that makes me sad because unfortunately it's been just such a common to jump from one thing to the next and not give it enough time, but also not exploring. And, and I know that you're into looking at labs as well, because you've mentioned it on, on previous podcasts and into, into your website as well about looking at labs and, and finding those inflammation numbers. I'm just curious, what numbers do you look at if folks, do we look at C-reactive protein? What, do you, what, are, what are all you looking at so that folks can kind of hear from someone else besides me um, yeah. as to what you're checking into? Yeah, I'm looking at four major uh, blood sugar regulating uh, mm -hmm. markers. So I'm looking at a fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, but I also look at fasting insulin mm -hmm. and C-peptide to determine if oh, there's okay. resistance. Yeah, okay. and so that's a really big factor. A lot of people don't realize they have insulin resistance where the cells cannot receive the glycogen, the glucose to, to fuel the, the, to make ATP from the mitochondria. So that's a really big factor. Um, and, and I'll get into the five reasons why we gain weight or cannot lose weight, but um, blood sugar is one of them. And so the other markers that I look at, I mean, I look at all the liver markers and kidney markers, but I look at inflammation. Um, I look at CRP, C-reactive protein, and I look at homocysteine. So homocysteine is a, is a major inflammatory marker, but it also is, has a lot to do with methylation, that, that gene mutation that we have to people typically who have MTHFR, not even realizing it and do not get that B vitamin will have those methylation issues. And so we see an elevated homocysteine. Well, homocysteine is, you know, leads, if it's high enough for long term, it can lead to cardiovascular disease and dementia and macular degeneration. And so we don't want our, uh, those inflammation markers. I also look at iron, a full panel of iron, and I'm looking at your storage, your ferritin, because the ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So I'm looking at that. 
Um, and I look at the full breakdown of the thyroid. So all nine markers of the thyroid, I'm looking at the white blood cells and looking at a pattern. I'm looking for a, a viral pattern or a a bacterial pattern to see if there's some underlying root causes there that could be driving the blood sugar issues or could be driving thyroid dysregulation or autoimmunity. Nice. Nice. Hey, let's kick out for a second on those nine markers of the thyroid, because I think a lot of people might be familiar with their doc running TSH and maybe free T4 if they're lucky. And if they go to a naturopath or a functional medicine doc, you might also get something called reverse T3. And you maybe get something called anti-TPO, which is anti-thyroid peroxidase, folks who are listening, and then anti-TGs, which is thyroglobulin antibodies to, to the thyroid. Now, what are the other ones that folks may not have come into contact with? Yeah, that would be an amazing panel if I got that. I never <laughs> really get that when people walk in the door, so that's why I order my own. But in addition to that, I look at free end totals for both three T uh, for T3 and for T4. Mm -hmm. And just for your listeners to understand T4 is our inactive thyroid hormone. It's 93% of that equation, right? Mm -hmm. We have to cleave off one atom of iodine and we get our active thyroid hormone. That's T3. And that's only 7%, right? So I equate it to trying to build a fire, right? TSH is the kindling. That's what the pituitary, the brain is making that it goes through the liver. This is why we detox, right? And we create T4. That's our wood. So kindling and wood are really important for a fire, but if you do not have a match, you will not have a fire. So that T3 is your match. And um, as you mentioned, allopathic medicine will just test for that TSH because usually, I mean, the body's supposed to give an alarm when there is no fire to give it more kindling, but it doesn't, it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other marker that I test for in addition to the two antibodies is T3 uptake. And T3 uptake is really important for our menopausal, perimenopausal, and really any woman, because anybody who's on birth control or anybody who's taking hormone replacement therapy is because it has to do with estrogens that are affecting the thyroid. It will compete for that thyroid cell. And um, it will, if you have excess estrogen, it will beat it out typically. So um, hormones are very, very uh, uh, important integral part of the thyroid. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's, it's something that, you know, said about this estrogen excess situation that sometimes can happen on a roller coaster with the perimenopausal folks. I mean, this can be the difference between thyroid working okay and thyroid not working so well, guys. So this is something to really, really pay attention to. Now, of course, we started everything talking about food diverted to a little bit of inflammation because let's be real. Most women, when they come in for their health stuff, it's, it's usually when the weight is a problem. That's usually right. one of the biggest triggers. Like I'm, I'm a little tired. I'm just, you know, we can, we can make excuses for that all day, but when the genes don't fit, all bets are off. Now we got to go. Yeah. What's, what's the deal. So let's talk about these different food frames that you have in a little bit more detail, because guys, of course, as I mentioned in the, the preview here, I had talked about Risa's book, which I find hilarious that you're, you're calling it the food is a four letter word, because really for, for most of my life, okay. I have a very similar story to you where my mom was always on a diet, trying to lose the same in her case, 20 pounds and never never happened. Um, and then of course, then it gave me this whole relationship with what the heck do I do with food? And, you know, probably about five years ago, I really like had to come down to the fact that I was like, I think I have an eating disorder based on all of this stuff and avoiding and, and whatnot. And so a lot of people will come to me and go, I don't know what to eat. And I feel like I already am like damaged about food. So the food frame, how do, how do we get around that with the food frame? Tell, tell us what the, the background is there. Yeah. So there's, um, and your story is so similar to, I mean, everybody has stuff right with food mm -hmm. and, we, and, and, there, and yeah, it's just, it's crazy. So it's about time we take control of, of our eating and have a good relationship with food. It's our fuel. We should have a good relationship with food and we should be setting an example for our daughters and our sisters and other women in our universe that food is not a, a tool of punishment of deprivation or reward or you know it's it's fuel mm -hmm. so um uh so there's six different diet types uh food frames in the book and uh so they're specific so the first ones that i would talk about for sh blood sugar dysregulation is paleo and keto 
So paleo is basically, uh, it stands for paleolithic times, and it basically is like the caveman diet. So it's based on what we were actually born to eat. What is our raw materials? What equipment do we have? And what that equipment that we're born with, what is it supposed to, what is it there to process, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are animal proteins, um, things that are growing from the ground. So any vegetables, sweet potato, yams, um, and good fats, eggs, nuts, seeds, olives, olive oil, coconut, coconut oil, avocado, avocado oil. And it, there's no dairy, there's no grains. Those came years later. Uh, there's no gluten, there's no um, sugar, there's no processed food. And it really focuses on quality. Mm -hmm. And it is my favorite of the six because it is the it, the, it has the most broadest appeal. Mm -hmm. So most people will do extraordinarily well with paleo mm -hmm. um, without many exceptions. And it really is just an anti-inflammatory uh, diet. And that's pretty much how I eat in a paleo way. Mm -hmm. So nobody can really go wrong with that. Then there's keto and keto is, is short for ketosis. The body is trying to get into the state of ketosis. So what is ketosis? Our fuel are, as I mentioned earlier, we all have these trillions of cells and we have these receptors on the cells and uh, inside the cells, we have these little things called mitochondria. Mitochondria are super important. They're very indicative of our long-term health and this, this, the quality of our health. And, um, and what it uses, there are energy factories and what it uses is, is glycogen. So we eat any kind of sugar or any carbohydrate that turns into a sugar and the, in, the, the pancreas pumps out insulin and it converts it to glycogen and it, it puts it in the cell and that cell creates the energy. So, um, if we, when we're in the state of ketosis, we stop that production or we really, uh, slow down considerably that production of carbohydrates and sugar and we switch to a higher fat content eating lifestyle. So you're eating about 75 to 85% of your daily intake is in fats. Mm -hmm. And they don't even have to be good fats, they can be bad fats. So you can have all the, the butter and cream and, and bacon and eggs and animal protein um, that you want typically, because we're really trying to not drive any carbohydrates. We're trying to, to, to create very little insulin. And so we switch our fuel source to fat and then we can take from the storage unit. So a lot of people can do really well with this. And this is something that I recommend for people who have a lot of weight to lose or who have um, very, very high levels of diabetes. So you're, you're well in your sevens or your eights on your A1C um, rather than just sort of at 6.4, but you could still do it at 6.4. What I do not recommend uh, for, for keto for people is people who do not have a gallbladder this is not the, this is not the lifestyle for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I test, I do a, a, a very comprehensive stool test. So I look at steatocrit to see if you have any fat malabsorption. I also look at GGT on a blood test to see how sludgy your bile is to see if you're sludgy and you're having a hard time digesting your fats. This is not for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then men typically do better on keto and women don't do as well. And it seems that cortisol has a lot to do with the success rate for people with keto. So if you're really got a lot of cortisol driving and you've got this high stress lifestyle, it, it wouldn't be for you, but everybody else would probably do really well on keto. And the challenge with keto is getting enough fiber in. Mm -hmm. You're eating a lot of fats without fibers. And so that's a tricky part. I don't recommend keto for longer than a three month stint. I would say do it for three months, take a few weeks off, maybe a month, and get back on it if you want to. There's um, a lot of studies that saying that this is really good for your health. And as I said, for somebody who has major blood sugar dysregulation, this would be a great option for you if you don't have those other things. Yeah. yeah. And, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I've seen in the research where it does seem to dra dramatically turn around diabetes, things of that nature. I have found that some women with, with menopause, and I, and I don't know if it is the cortisol levels per se, or a little bit of the estrogenic effect or what's going on, but I've seen some women just definitely struggle on, on the keto side of things in yeah. that aspect. And it's very for, frustrating for women. Um, it just is for me personally, when I did keto, I could not even get into the state of ketosis. 
I just couldn't. I needed exogenous ketones to get into that state. So not everybody can do uh, get into ketosis. So I recommend if you do want to do it, just take a urine test or a, a, a prick test, a blood prick test to make sure you're producing enough ketones to get into the state of ketosis. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely something that, you know, I, I encountered myself when I was doing the, the same diet, had to use the powdered ketones. Right. <laughs> Yucky things, man. Yeah. It's just Yucky. Exactly. Funky yeah. stuff. So if you guys have ever tried that, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast. So right. keep going. Tell us more about the rest yeah. of the food frames here. So if you have um, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, or IBD, irritable bowel disease, or you have SIBO, which is very common, most people don't even know that they have SIBO, yeah. but yeah. SIBO is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, where a bacteria parks itself in the small intestines rather than the large, and it absorbs water. So what happens, these people are people who have chronic bloating, and it's usually coupled with chronic diarrhea or chronic constipation or an alternating chronic mm. diarrhea and constipation. So these, these people would do really, really, really well with the low FODMAP eating lifestyle or food frame. And low FODMAP, FODMAP is an acronym that stands for fermented oligosaccharides and disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And in plain English, these are carbohydrates that will cause a methane gas production typically, and you will bloat um, and cause all those other things. So this is a uh, elimination diet. And so it's from 30 to 90 days. The stricter you are at the beginning, the better off you'll be. And if you can go 90 days, that would be great. You get a little bit, uh, a little bit more leniency as you progress, but it, it can be extraordinarily effective. I've seen people tons and tons of times that can help uh, accompanied with um, supplementation to, to be able to, to kill the SIBO which is very recurring. So it's, uh, but at least you can always go back to low FODMAP if you needed to. Okay. Um, so that one's a little restrictive. It is not calorie restrictive, but it is um, restrictive as far as what foods to, to, that you're able to have and it's quantity restrictive. Mm -hmm. So you can have one asparagus, let's say for the first week and then the second week you can have two and so on and so forth but you can eat animal protein and there's plenty of food that you can eat, but you do have to be very careful. These are the people who have hard time with onions and garlic. Um, yeah. So uh, that, that, that's a great uh, eating program or food frame for those people. And then there is um, low lectin mm -hmm. um, and autoimmunity. So AIP, which is autoimmune protocol, is a wonderful program, uh, food frame that you can do. And I recommend this for anybody who has any kind of autoimmune disease. If you have more than one autoimmune disease, I would absolutely jump on this immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very restrictive. There is no question about it. It is an elimination diet as well, 30 to 90 days. I would encourage you if you have two autoimmune or anybody to do at least uh, that it would do the 90 days. You'll feel amazing. And a lot of people, I was working with somebody who had Tourette's, she saw a tremendous uh, decrease in her Tourette's from doing autoimmunity. And a lot of people will not have flare ups. A lot of auto, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients will see a major decrease in pain. So uh, I'm a big fan of AIP. It's very similar to paleo but it's a little bit more restrictive. So there's no nuts, there's no seeds, there's um, no alcohol, um, no chocolate, um, there's uh, no nightshades. Nightshades are a big one that can cause inflammation. So it is a bit restrictive, but again, it's a really great payout for those people who have autoimmunity. So it's something I do recommend for sure. Um, and then once you're finished with the AIP protocol, I recommend either the low lectin uh, food frame or the paleo food frame. And low lectin is sort of similar to AIP, but lectins are basically, they're, they're protective coatings on B, uh, grain, I'm sorry, on uh, brands or seeds or germs, basically on, on uh, plants. Mm -hmm. And so as living organisms, we all have the ability to cope with danger, right? Humans, we, we will flee, kick, scream, yell, call 911 to, to flee a situation. Uh, some danger and plants don't have that ability. So what they do is they have what I call a hard candy shell around mm -hmm. that germ or that seed. 
and that and they want to protect themselves right because we all want to survive and procreate those are two main goals as living organisms and what happens is it's very hard to break down that that outer shell so for people who don't have a very acidic uh, environment in their stomachs let's say they're taking antacids or they just have a lot of stress they don't produce a lot of digestive enzymes this um this would be good because you cannot break down those lectins very difficult those are the people who will bloat with hummus and beans. They say, oh, don't bring those near me. Those are not good, right? So they know who they are. And low lectin would be great. So it is another anti-inflammatory uh, eating lifestyle. And so I, I love low lectin. And then there's vegetarian or vegan. I go through that in the book in great detail, the different types of vegetarian um, that there are. And um, this one is not really one of my most recommended uh, food frames. Mm -hmm. um, I know that people have a lot of uh, attachment to being vegetarian. I was, I'm a former vegan myself and I understand that process. So if they are, I have some people who I work with who have for religious reasons, just ne have never had meat or people who really have a, a lot of um, ethical ideas around that. I'm totally okay with that then I recommend this kind of vegetarian. Um, it, it has a wide scope. So you have vegetarians who are eating French fries, Oreos, and Coke um, versus the, the vegetarians who are eating actual vegetables and, and, and food that fuels them, right? Yes, yes. I, I think I had a stint in high school as a cheese and bread Italian. Right. Um, exactly. it was really when you were kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The good way to gain weight. Oh. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then I always recommend my detox to start for the two weeks while you're figuring out your food frame, because it's really important. We have so many toxins. The um, FDA, this is a new number. I'm sorry to report has approved 86,000 chemicals for us to use well over 3000 we can eat. And we're about uh, 2000 approved every year, no matter who's in the white house. And most of them aren't even tested. So it's a, we have to be very diligent about our toxins. Absolutely great. Absolutely great. It's something that I definitely talk about quite a bit here on the podcast between that and your drinking water, the, you know, airy breathe, trying to control what you can inside your home and, and office place. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people will ask me, well, well, how do we get here in the first place? Well, the chemicals in your food. That's how this, that's how this happened. Yep. And, and sadly, you know, how, how did the bacteria happen while well, the chemicals in the food you know, <laughs> reduced your, your immune sense. And so it's a, uh, uh, it's a conundrum. It's such a conundrum. Now there's one thing that you mentioned about, um, I need to go back to it. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people will want to hear your opinion on it. The oils back in paleo, I'm going to go back through a couple of different of the foods because what I found with, with the oils is that sometimes there's a, a difficult understanding between the refined oils and the non-refined oils when it comes to paleo. Mm -hmm. How, how do you help folks find the right oils for, for their body and what they deal with the best? So great question. Um, pretty much everybody would do well with anti-inflammatory oils. And what are those? So we want to cook with, with oils that have high heat, uh, that have a high smoke point, right? If we don't, we're heating up these oils. We're, we're, um, increasing the volume of the, the molecules and basically it becomes rancid. It becomes an inflammatory oil. So these are oils like soybean oil, um, canola oil, vegetable oil, um, safflower oil, sunflower oil. These are all treated usually in a restaurant. You'll find these oils. Sometimes you'll get the, it's a blend. Mm -hmm. So the blend is basically all canola oil with a drop of olive oil, right? And who even knows? But yeah, it's cheaper. It's more self-stable. It doesn't have taste. Um, there's a million reasons why they use it, but one is cost. And I don't care which restaurant you go to. I've asked every wonderful restaurant. I've gone to five-star spas and I ask the kitchen. That's where I get the blend usually, but the, they are everywhere. So consider yourself when you're dining out, unless you are at a major committed health food uh, restaurant that you're having bad uh, rancid inflammatory oils. And it's interesting. I'm working with a rheumatoid arthritis patient right now who uh, we got her down really, really, really far. But she was really not having any uh, inflammation, any pain, any flare ups at all. And then it came back and I said, well, what oils are you using? And she was actually using olive oil at high heat 
and she took it out. And the next week I spoke to her, she said, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So it could just be that. Um, so the things that do have high smoke point, uh, 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 values at, uh, are avocado oil and coconut oil. Mm -hmm. So both of those are great to cook with at high heat. Olive oil is one of the best oils on the market if you can get a good clean one, but it's really better at raw or at uh, lower temperatures. Um, and then I use sesame oil as well. I use that occasionally when I do uh, an Asian dish or something like that. And that has a decent smoke point as well. So those are the ones that I would recommend. And I would, all the rancid oils, it's really an amazing way to increase your inflammation. Very effective. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, they fall into the trap of the healthy junk food that we have on the market, the organic chips that are in expeller pressed safflower and, and sunflower. And unfortunately, you know, you read that and you're like, oh, you know, it's, it's organic. I'm, you know, I joke, no calories, um, you know, but there's also the, the concept of, oh, I'm eating these things that are supposedly cleaner, but really when you break it down, it just, you just paid more for it. You just paid more well, for it. I go to the natural food show every year and I walk the aisles and, the, and every year it's bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, it's, it's crazy how big it is and it's fun. It's you walk down the aisles, but I sometimes say, remember, this is still all made in a factory. Mm -hmm. These all have nutritional panels, right? We should be eating foods that do not have ingredient panels, right? Because we should just be eating things that grow from the ground and crawl on the earth. Right. Um, but it, so it's hard because there is a better for you, uh, junk food market for sure. Right. So occasionally that's okay. But you, as you said, there's a ton of expeller pressed is better, but it's still not as good. So, so that brings me to one of the other objections that I get a lot from patients. They're like, okay, if I'm going to be making whole foods and, and really cooking for myself, is there any way to hack it to make it easier? because now I have to make everything, you know, from, from scratch. So I'd love to hear how you help your folks to, to create a plan that's sustainable for them. So there's a few ways. I mean, I, I always say when you go to work, right, if you have to have a presentation, do you do any preparation or do you just go in blind, right? So if you want to be successful at anything, if you want to be a successful athlete or um, be good at you know, crossword puzzles, I mean, you, you, it takes practice. You have to prepare. You have to give it some time. You have to value that. Um, and so there is some time. Now, there are tons of organization companies that will send uh, food, prepared food to your door. So we're really living in a day and age where it becomes really, really easy to do that. They'll even send you food that's chopped that you can actually just make it in your own pan. But so we really have a lot more resources than we used to. So that's another way to do it is for those people who just do not want to cook, I would absolutely recommend those food services. There are some clean ones out there that can deliver to your door versus ordering in day after day after day. Um, it's just the, the, the inflammatory oils and the, the bad ingredients, the very low quality ingredients are going to affect your health for sure. It's an accumulative effect. Um, but the other thing I do is I say on a Sunday or in a, whatever day that it is that you have to cook, make a big batch of chili or cut all your vegetables or make a big jar of pesto and put it one in the freezer and you know, just put things in the freezer so that you can pull it out. If you need to pull it out by serving, great. Um, you can make a bunch of turkey burgers and put them in the freezer and pull them out as needed. So I just say, if you're cooking, just cook a lot and put it in the freezer, cut your vegetables. So cutting your vegetables, you know, that's one of the things that I wish vegetables would just wash themselves and cut themselves. I, I feel like that would be so much easier for a lot of people. And a lot of people will ask me about cutting vegetables and be like, can I get the ones that are in the bag at the grocery store? Are those okay? What's your opinion on that? So, you know, I'm a big fan of anything that's convenient, but really the long road is always going to be the better road because it's just got more nutrients. So the carrots that you're buying that are in little tiny shapes, you know, they're, they're not grown out of the ground like that. Right. So they're processed, they're washed, they're peeled, they're, they're just processed. Um, but they're better than Twinkies. There isn't a question about that. But if you could do it, take it one notch higher, I would get the carrots. I get it with the tops on. Mm -hmm. And then I just take the tops off either at the market or when I get home. And then it's 
still has all these nutrients in them. And then I peel them and I cut them. And so for example, on Sundays, I do cut all my vegetables and I put them in the refrigerator because I take a baggie with me to work. And I take, I have a baggie when I get home that when I, when I'm hungry and I get home at the end of the day, if there is not real food in my refrigerator, I'm going to go into the pantry and find some dead food. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't have junk in my house, but it's going to be nuts or, or things that are not, I mean, they're good, but they're not as good as a protein, fat and fiber. I'm all about protein, fat and fiber at every chance you possibly have to eat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny how you say dead food. Literally I have come home, not been prepped. And then I'm going like head first into the pantry and finding like morsels of chocolate that have been in there for probably two years and stay on. I'm like, it tastes horrible, but I'm feeling like I needed this. Oh man. I know that's a, it's a thing. It's a, it's a thing. So meal prep is huge. And, and it's one of those things that I, I try to tell folks, you know, really there are little hacks, but ultimately, you know, sheet pan meals, all, you know, the crock pot, all that, and really embracing all that. But the, the bottom line is you can't work your way out of a poor diet. You just can't. And right. And just like anything you want to be successful in life, you've just, you can't go out and run a marathon. You've got to train for it. You've got to work for it. So anything else in life, this is not a shortcut. You have to put the time into it so you can be successful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And training yourself to eat healthy is a thing too. And I think that's one thing that a lot of folks don't realize is that it, you can't just all of a sudden flip the switch and be like, okay, I'm not going to eat junk food anymore. You know, it, it takes time to train yourself to make the meals, to train yourself to even think in a different way about food. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because there's, you know, the, here's a sad statistic that one out of every three children born today will be type two diabetic. Mm. So a lot of kids don't realize where the actual food comes from. They think it right. comes from a window when you're driving. Mm -hmm. So we need to take kids back to the farm, have them pick. I love fall season because it's a great time to go and pick the pumpkins and pick the squash and pick the green beans so that you understand and have your kids get involved in the cooking and the preparation of food so that they are invested in that. Um, have them pick out recipes online so that they say, oh, I want to make that on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I usually say to families, you know, give every kid a night of the week that they get to pick the recipe. They'll get to help it in the kitchen to help with the cleaning or the preparation or the cooking or something so that they take some investment, take some pride in what they're eating. And then they know the source of where it comes from, that it's not just through a window. Yeah. Right. We order from a microphone or, you know, it's just crazy to me. Right. It's true. It's true. And really, you know, even, you know, once you get that down, moving into growing your own food a little bit and whether it's in a container pot, you know, just some lettuce or something of that. I mean, I, I love, love when I, I worked in a, in a clinic in Colorado that was sponsored by a, a group that helped us to teach kids and their families how to cook. And it was my most favorite thing wow. because you would see the kids just like it light bulb, like, oh, wait, we have a garden because we had a garden as well. And we could pick, take them through, pick it and then go make food. And it was like, they ate it. It was, That's there was no amazing. question about, no, I don't want that. That's gross. No, I picked that. I'm eating that thing. <laughs> exactly. I love that. That's the best thing you could do with kids. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So Gosh, Risa, so much great information today. And, and I think folks are really going to embrace the idea of the food frame, you know, that just really kind of getting this framework going of like, okay, I don't have to fall into this particular diet per se. I can start with this, progress to something else and kind of fall into, you know, a sustainable plan for myself and being able exactly. to choose it. So your book, I'm guessing is available everywhere. Books are available. I saw Amazon. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's on Amazon, Target, um, Barnes and Noble, and my website at Risa Grew Nutrition. Mm -hmm. And if folks want to work with you, I know that they can also do that as well. So tell us a little bit about that so folks can check out your book and then learn how to work with you and, and all of it. Yeah, I work with people all over the world, actually, but um, it's hard to order labs in other countries, but I work with all, all, all over the States. 
And um, I do it via Zoom and you can just contact us at the office by email or phone and we can set up an appointment and initial nutritional consultation. And then we start working together. We start ordering labs and that's everything can be found on my website at Risa, R-I-S-A, Gru, G-R-O-U-X, nutrition.com. And there is also my course that I just released called Achieving Optimal Thyroid Health. Nice. And um, I'm all about the thyroid. I'm super proud of that class. I put everything I know, and I know a lot about thyroid into that class. So no matter if you have thyroidectomy, you have Graves, you have Hashis, you're hyper, hypo, whatever it is, it's going to tell you everything you need to know what to eat, what not to eat, what supplements to take, what not to take. I mean, a million things all uh, that you would need to know for thyroid. So nice. you can find all that on that. And then I'm on Instagram at Risa Green Nutrition and TikTok and um, Pinterest and all those fun places. Excellent. Excellent. And you also have a detox kit that comes with when, when they're, when someone's working with you in particular, I've noticed, and you've got a a special for folks, if they want to try out the detox kit, I also think they should probably work with you or something at least the book at the very least. So tell tell us how it all goes together so we can. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of detoxing because we store those heavy metals or those toxins in our, um, in our fat cells and our fat tissues. So, I mean, um, the benefits are amazing. It's, it's mental clarity, it's better skin, it's regularity. People do it for the weight loss, but it is not a weight loss program. I firmly believe that weight loss is a side effect of wellness. Mm-hmm. It is a wellness program. So it's really important to take out the trash so the liver can work optimally and do all its conversions and filterings and all the things that it needs to do. And um, so the detox is a 14 day program. It's two shakes a day with collagen protein. I'm a big fan of collagen and it has amino acids and antioxidants to help open up pathways one and two. And then you're eating real food. So you're having animal protein, unlimited vegetables, sweet potato, yams, good fats. You'll feel amazing. And, um, and you'll, you'll just, it'll just optimize your body once we start getting your blood work and your stool test. So we usually start off there and um, people just, I'm rave reviews about the detox. So it's, I do it personally all the time. I love it. It makes me feel good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we all need little resets here and there, just because as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, the 86,000 chemicals we're being exposed to a day. I mean, there's just that need to help our bodies out as, as we go on. And, and in the past I've said, I don't really know what I think about detoxes when someone's like, Oh, I'm going to eat crappy. And then I'm going to detox later. I'm more like, I think we need to do it more on a maintenance thing just for keeping us healthy. That's my stance on it. Exactly. I completely agree with you. I mean, think about if you don't ever clean out your garage, what would happen, right? You can't park your car in there anymore. It's not functional. You can't find anything. So it's exactly like that. Um, we have to do that. Now we all have the ability to detoxify ourselves, but if we're not methylizing properly, we're not doing that. So it, it really kicks the can and it could cause major issues in the, in the future. So absolutely detox at least once a year, maybe twice or three times. Awesome. Awesome. So folks, you can try out Reese's Detox at HealthFix10. That's your code for 10% off. I'll also put that in the podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. Risa, thank you so much for coming on and chatting all about your book. You guys got to check it out. I will put the notes there as well. And gosh, just such a great amount of information. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.